What we have to do as producers prepare this sow for that breed back after that weaning event. And there's a lot that goes into it. Breeders, <clears throat> how many in here work in the breeding department? Okay, you all get blamed for a lot of things that aren't your fault. Okay? I'm going to say that up front here today. Uh, so what I like to talk about is what are, our, what are our top ten to win to get these sows bred back post weaning. So one of the things I think is really overlooked on some farms is we get these sows too daggone heavy. And I like to see these sows, for most all genetics, really at a body condition score of a 2.7 to 3 when they come into the farmhouse. house. Heavyweight sows create a lot of issues for us. Um, when these sows come into the farm, and I like to see these sows fed 6 to 8 pounds per day that two to three days prior to farrowing, more feed through the GI tract. Um, there's several, several things that go into why we should be maybe bumping that feed a little bit earlier. Number one is we're concerned about getting proper intakes in these sows during, during lactation. A lot of times we'll see constipation issues in these sows when we first put them in the farrowing crates and that sort of thing. A sow that's constipated will not eat, will not eat properly, you know, and we and we know that. Um, we'll we'll keep that sow a little more content during the farrowing process. She's not going to be up and down wanting fed if we bump that feed to her a little bit. And with the reduced constipation, is going to come lower stillborns on these sows. So, you know, we can use laxatives and we can do some different things, but I think just simply just running more material through that GI tract. Uh, is going to be beneficial. So we've got to optimize lactation feed intake, and we've got to manage these sows to defecate. And you're going to hear me say this several times today. We've got to get those sows up. She's got to urinate. She's got to defecate, or she's not going to eat properly in, in that farrowing house. So if you have ad-lib feeders in your farms, ad-lib feeders can be a wonderful thing. Ad-lib feeders can be almost a kiss of death on, on breeding programs. And so why do I say that? So <clears throat> ad-lib feeders can reduce labor requirements, but they come with pot potential problems. And those problems are they're difficult to monitor intakes. On a lot of ad-lib ad feed systems, we really don't have a good idea of what these intakes are on these sows. And, and I think that's an issue. Um, does your ad-lib feeder... Um, kind of go along with natural behavior for the sow? Or are we asking these, we bring a guild into a crate with a type of ad-lib feeder that maybe she's got to be like a circus animal and do tricks to get her feed down. You know, she's got to flip levers and she's got to hit balls and this and that and the other. We've got to be careful with those kind of things because that's, that's not natural behavior. And so what, what we'll see with these sows is maybe she should have eaten eight pounds of feed during this eight-hour period. Well, she gets frustrated with messing with the, the lever, the ball, the whatever she happens to be using, and she'll eat six pounds and say, you know what, I got enough, I'm going to lay down, I'm, I'm done with messing with this. So we've got to be really careful where we use hammer mills, um, they can have a detrimental effect if we're not doing a good job keeping our screens changed and our, and our hammers changed, different particle sizes. Uh, will cause issues with these some of these ad-lib feeders. So those are all things to keep in mind if you're going down that route with ad-lib systems. It's easy to miss low intake events. So most farms will have a translucent tube that comes down with some kind of markings on it, two, four, six, eight pounds. They don't have to be real accurate, but you can look through this room of sows and say, okay, everybody's down here, they, they've all eaten well. If we get in a hurry, it's awful easy just to walk in and flip a switch and walk out of the room. So those are some things we've got to be careful about. Um, yeah. So target to keep 80% of litters intact. So what does that have to do with breed back on these sows? Well, I think it has quite a lot to do with breed back on these sows. Disruptions of these litters um, can definitely ha have some, some impacts, and we'll talk a little more about that as we get closer to, to weaning time. Be cautious with bump litters, fall-behind litters, and piglet euthanasia. 
as these can po possibly stimulate sows into heat. And uh, we've had some experiences where, where we, we know that for sure. And so think about what we do when we make bump litters. We make nurse sows and that sort of thing. So today's weaning day. And we wean the pigs off of the sow, and they go on the truck, and they're going to nursery, wean to finish or whatever. But we decide we're going to keep this sow back. We're going to move her down to another room, and we're going to put 10 pigs on her for a week. That were good pigs. They were just smaller pigs and that sort of thing. So we move her down to a room. We maybe get pigs on her right away. Maybe we don't. And if you really go back and watch those sows, a lot of time those sows, after we put the 10 pigs on them, she's laying in, our, in there on her belly, and she's saying, what are you doing to me? These aren't my pigs. I, I'm not going to nurse them. And she lays there for a while. Her udder gets full of milk. She gets uncomfortable. The pigs are rooting around on her. She rolls over. They nurse her, relieve the pressure off her udder, and she says, ah, I guess this isn't all that bad. It's very possible we've already tripped that next reproductive cycle uh, there early in the Farling house. When we do this, when we're using bump sows and nurse sows, um, I really encourage you to use as many cull sows as possible when you're doing that because uh, then we're not quite, quite so concerned about if we trip them into heat. Manage sow and piglet vaccinations so that a normal lactation event is not compromised. So what we know is that some vaccines will create a temperature spike and a reduced intake in these sows. And that can be detrimental to reproductive performance. What we also know, and we, we actually, uh, our animal health team had experienced this not all that long ago, uh, piglet vaccines have the same, same kind of consequences. So we had, a, we had a farm we were working with and we were monitoring return to estrus on, on these weaned sows. And it was very erratic. We would have a, a pretty good sized group of sows in heat day two, day three post weaning maybe for a couple of weeks, and then we would have sows that are pretty normal, day four, day five. Couldn't get our finger on, on what, what was really going on there. Well, as we, as we got talking to the farm manager, you know, what are you doing for vaccinations? Well, I'm giving a circle micro vaccine to the pigs prior to weaning. Okay, when are you giving that? Well, I tell the barn crew, just whenever you have time, which is never a good instruction, but whenever you have time that week prior to weaning, those pigs that are going out need to get that microcircle vaccination. Well, what we found was happening is when they would do those farther away from the wean date, it had more of a negative effect. Because if you think about this, so we're buzzing those pigs with that vaccine. They're not feeling good. They got a little bit of a temperature. Their consumption goes down. Their milk consumption goes down. How much? I don't know for sure. How long? I don't know for sure. Is it four hours, eight hours, 12 hours? I don't know. But we do know that it goes down because those pigs are feeling tough after they've gotten that vaccine. So we're tripping some of those sows in the heat. So what we asked them to do was get that vaccination as close to weaning as possible so that we weren't disrupting that uh, quite as much, that normal return to estrus. I will say this, consult your veterinarian. Talk to your veterinarian about it. I, I don't want to be playing veterinarian up here. But we do know that vaccines can have a, have a negative effect. Another one, wean wall to wall. Well, why is that important? Well, several reasons. One, look, we all know that all in, all out is the right thing to do. Uh, I've cheated that system thousands of times. You go into 48 crate room, you wean 36 sows, and I've got 12 litters scattered out in there. I move them all over to one row. I come in, I wash 36 crates, aerosol everything that's in there over those 12 that I just moved. And then to compound the problem, next week I wean those 12, and I aerosol that back over the 36 new litters. You know, let's face it, folks, that's not very smart. And we've all done it because we're chasing wean age or, or whatever the reason. But it's not good. But any time we're moving that sow and litter around, we take a chance of jump-starting that sow into heat early. And then later on we call that a late sow when truly it's not. <clears throat> so when we move these out to the breed row, for many years, I was not a proponent of, of uh, a designated breed row in, in the breeding barn. I like to move them out into gestation, snake my way through. I've since changed my mind on that a lot. Um, 
I think we need to have a designated breed row, and we'll, we'll touch on a little bit here why, and mainly for, for intakes post weaning. But when you have that bre designated breed row, keep it clean and keep it dry. We see too many times people are weaning sows, they're taking them out and putting them in a breed row, and they're greasy and they're nasty and there's manure there. And I, I feel like this summer we had some pretty significant bacterial issues. Uh, if, if you have a designated breed row and you're washing that every week when you're weaning sows, you don't have a lot of buildup. It's a pretty quick, painless process, and, and I think it pays pretty big dividends. So let's be cautious of these out-of-feed events weaning to breed row. And so what I mean by that, nobody likes going back and reclaiming feed out of the farrowing crates. And whether you have an ad-lib system or you're feeding three times a day with a scoop, you know, if you're running a power washer and you hit that, you know, it feeds blowing everywhere, that's not cool. And, you know, so farms want to have a minimal amount of feed in those feeders when we wean. So what do we do? We're weaning today. So we shut the system off earlier tomorrow afternoon, or we back the feed off just a little bit yesterday afternoon so that this morning the feeders are pretty well empty. Okay, that in itself is not a good thing. And then to, to compound matters, and I've seen this time and time again, so we come in, we do our normal chores on the farm, the breeding crew went, dropped feed to all their sows, uh, Farrell and crew kind of doing their basics, now we're all grouped together and we're going to pull pigs and, and we're going to uh, wean these pigs. Well, we run these sows out to the breed row, and is there feed waiting for them? No, there's not, because if I had to drop feed, I couldn't have run the water in my trough. And so that's a little bit of a problem. So when we go and we look at this, we may possibly be, so she's not going to eat feed maybe till tomorrow morning. We may possibly be 30 hours uh, if that sow had a not, no feed event. So here she was at whatever level she was eating, 16, 20, 24 pounds a day, whatever number that was, and she's coming along here pretty consistent, and now we got her down here. Boom. She's catabolic, and we got to remember, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Charlie Francisco, uses this term, and I, I use it a lot. Um, reproduction is a luxury. And if this sow thinks that, man, these guys are starving me to death, we can have some negative impacts on, on that return to estrus, on follicle recruitment and, and development. So, target 50 pounds of feed intake from wean to breed on day five. How many in here are getting 50 pounds in them from weaning to day five? Nobody. You can do it. I mean, you can get 50 pounds in them. So, when we talk about that, what we're doing is, is we're letting our equipment, our routine, manage us instead of us managing it. So we got to remember, when that sow's in the farrowing crate, she is a nibbler. She's eating small meal, meals multiple times per day. When we wean her and we put her in the breed row, if we want her to eat 10 pounds, now remember, yesterday she ate 20, 16, whatever that number is. Today, we're going to put her in the breed row and we want her to eat 10 pounds, we said, my sows won't do that, they'll only eat five. Well, they'll only eat five in a 20 minute period or a 30 minute period, whatever you've designated because you dropped the feed down. She didn't clean up the whole 10 pounds in 30 minutes. Now that's a pain for you because you want, you're wanting to run the water. And you got feed there. Well, she wouldn't have eaten 10 pounds in 30 minutes in a farrowing house either. So we gotta keep that in mind. So what I really like to see people do is use a dry trough and use a nipple set back in a designated breed row back from the, from the trough so that she has ample time to eat that feed. Because I'm, I'm telling you, she won't eat 10 pounds in 20, 30 minutes. She just won't. She was a nibbler. Now we're trying to make her a gobbler. And what doesn't happen overnight. So I, I think that's really critical. Will these sows eat 50 pounds? <coughs> Excuse me. From weaning to day five? Absolutely they will. Absolutely. But we have to manage it. We're letting... Our equipment, our facilities manage us on a lot of this. So, what's our goal in this whole thing? Our goal is that we have a normal lactation event so then that we can facilitate a normal wean to estrus event. And if we don't have a normal lactation event, odds of a high percentage of our sows having a normal wean to estrus event is is not very good. 
So let's stop here a minute. What is a normal wean to estrus event? And I feel a little bit intimidated because I see Dr. Singleton sitting back there and Dr. Stewart and the reproductive physiologists and, and that sort of thing. My opinion, a normal wean to estrus event is that we need to have 90% of these sows in heat on day four, day five. If she's not in heat on day four, day five, in my opinion, that is not a normal wean to estrus event. <laughs> So, as I said to you earlier, you folks in the breeding barn are getting a lot of blame for a lot of things. Uh, some of it may be justified, some of it may not. But the responsibility of a normal wean to estrus event is shared by both the farrowing staff and the breeding gestation group. Um, I see that a lot. I'm on your side, breeders. Uh, you guys get a bad rap sometimes. So what should we expect? We should expect 90 to 95 percent of these sows, these wean sows, in heat on day four to five. If they're not, what are the reasons why they're not in heat? Well, she was a P1. We bred her a little bit young. You know, we knew we shouldn't have, but Wayne Singleton told me I had a breeding target I had to meet, and he's going to come down on me if I don't meet my breeding target, and I had a lightweight gilt in heat, so I bred her. Okay, she come in, feral a, no a normal litter, did a great job during lactation, but she had a lot of growth yet to do. We had trouble getting groceries into her, and she's a late sow coming out. That is a problem, and, and we see that a lot, you know, when people try to cheat the system a little bit. So this is some pretty recent data on 3.2 million sows from Pig Champ, and we look at this and we talk about day four and day five. If you add these together right here, we're talking about 70% of first services are happening on day four and day five. And we just said a little bit ago that we'd really like to see that at 90%. So we got 70% of first services day four and five, but if you come over here and look at greater than 15, we're up at 10% or slightly above. So now you add those two together, you're at 80. What's causing all these out here? And remember, this is first service, so that's not a recycle sow or or, or something like that. So on those 90 to 95 percent of wean sows on day four to five, those sows, I truly believe you should be expecting a 95 percent conception rate on those animals. And uh, I think too many times we get complacent with, well, 80, 85, 87, that, that's okay. No, I, it's really not okay. We can do better than that. We just got to manage these sows and we gotta, we, we've got to keep turning over rocks and figuring out why we're not having normal return to estrus. And of those that you get a 95% conception rate on, I'm saying we ought to be targeting getting a 90 to 93% furling rate on these sows. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about 2% post ultrasound fallout. So we made it a hundred of those sows. We had 95 of them, uh, in, uh, confirmed pregnant with the ultrasound, and we ended up feraling somewhere between 90 and 93. You're probably going to, you know, I think a good target is 2% fallout post-ultrasound on crated facilities, maybe slightly higher on pin gestation. Depending upon the type of pin gestation you have, it may be 4% fallout there. So when we talk about feraling rate by wean to first service, so, you know, here, 3, 4, and 5, that's kind of our, our high point. You know, sixes and sevens drop off a little bit. Day sixes, 5% reduction versus day four to five. Day sevens, 10% reduction to day four to five. So when we start talking about economics here and that sort of thing, if we only have just a few of those, it's really not a big deal. It's really not. But if we, if we start having way too many of these late sows, well, we're peeling off, if we average the two, seven and a half percent on farrowing rate on whatever percent of those you have. So if that percentage is very high, um, that can be that can really start to be an e economic issue. Then we want to talk about total born by wean to first service, and so you can see right here, you know, the, the, these these numbers here are pretty good. We tail off as we get out day six and day seven. You know, eights, nines, and tens are going to be pretty well the same. But so why do we have such a, such a bump when we get out here to day 15? Well, I would like to suggest that the majority of those day 15s are second heat animals, like 
like, like when we skip heat. Well, I think we all know the benefit of skip heat and a P1 and that sort of thing. There are times when it is definitely economically viable. There's times when maybe it's not. When corn was 650 a bushel, maybe it wasn't quite as economically viable. But what we do know here, when we start looking at this total born, we have over a pig and a half advantage versus day six when we're talking about out here 15 plus. A pig and a half advantage over day six and basically a two pig advantage over day sevens. So that's, that's a pretty big deal. And I, whatever you value those pigs at in your system, 30 bucks, 35, whatever that number is, uh, you know, you add this to a 5 to 10 percent reduction in farrowing rate, and now we're, we're starting to talk about some dollars. If you happen to be a farm that's not doing a good job on lactation intakes, and maybe you've got 20 percent, 30 percent, and I've seen it, 30 percent of these sows not in heat until day six and day seven. You know you're going to have a lower front rate. You know you're going to have a lower total born. We really need to take a look and go back to the beginning of my slide set and talk about in farrowing, do we have these sows in the right condition? Uh, are we using vaccines judi judiciously? Those types of things. So we've hit on those. So how do we meet these expectations? We've got to properly train our staff. Too many times, the number one message we send to our breeding team is, you've got a breeding target of X amount of sows, X amount of females bred per week, period. And so what happens, and, and I'll actually go back here a little bit. I want to show you this. So I'm going to tell you that a lot of these animals made it on day four were not in real good standing heat on day four. And I see it time and time again on farms. The reason they get bred, the breeding team has a breeding target to meet. Maybe we've had some issues. We've not quite met the breeding target. So, boy, she's close. I mean, I, yeah, I think she's standing. Let me, let me work her a little bit. Let's go ahead and breed her. And those matings are wasted matings. We, we, we don't need to be mating those, those, those kind of animals. So I really think uh, a fair amount of these animals would really fall over into the day five category if we were doing a really good job on, on heat detection. So we've got to properly train our staff. These folks need to know and have the skill set to meet your expectations. And if they don't, if they're just going through, through the routine of inserting, inserting a catheter, getting that semen put in the sow, but not really understanding the, the, the heat detection how much benefit there might be to wait till tomorrow to breed that sow, um, we, we have an issue. So properly train our staff is also an important idea. I hit it twice, guys, because it is, it is so important that we properly train our people. And when I go to farms, I don't care whose genetics you got, I don't care what boar stud you're getting your semen out of, I don't care what nutritional program you got, the key differences between these farms are properly trained staff and the people. And, and, and that is really, really important, not only in the breeding, but in the farrow and preparing her for breeding. Okay, so we wean these sows. We need, to, we need to get boar exposure with active, sexually mature boars. I think we all know that. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I, some of you have got that old boar that's been around the farm for four or five years, and, boy, he's, he's kind of your favorite, and you use him a lot. And why do you use him? Because he knows every turn to make, I can open the gate, he'll go back into his pen or his crate just fine. And actually he may be a terrible boar to be using out here. Uh, but we use him because it's, it's easy, it's convenient, and, he, and he's trained. I actually have, have gotten to the point where I encourage people a lot to just use some home raised boars. Take those little pocket pigs, what I call pocket pigs, those little one and a half pound pigs that aren't going to make it anyway. Keep them as boards. Keep them housed together four to six boards at a time. Make it very, very simple. I don't want to increase your labor load or whatever. Have good gates that you can block off the aisles uh, on these breed rows. So when you wean these sows and you put them out there, give them mass bore exposure. Kick six of those young guys out there at a time. And uh, I, I, I think you'll see a difference. This drive-by with one old boar that's just kind of drudging along um, doesn't cut it in, in my mind. So proper semen storage and hygiene. All right, so all of our economics coming down the road, whether we're selling wean pigs, 
whether we're producing pigs for our own wean to finish barns, that whole revenue stream is dependent on what we're doing in the breeding barn. It is absolutely dependent upon what we're doing in the breeding barn. And so when I make a farm visit, one of the first things I do is I go in, and usually it's up around the office somewhere, is I open that semen cooler. And, man, some of them are nasty. I mean, nasty sometimes. And you take the cool packs out that they're storing in the semen cooler, and there's some kind of a green velvet over it growing. I don't know what the hell it is. But it's, it's a bacteria of some sort. And do you reckon we could possibly cross-contaminating those tubes or those bags as we're handling that and handling the tubes and those kind of things? A lot of farms can do a, should really ramp up their semen storage and hygiene. So this is what I like to see at farms. Too many times I'll go in and they've got a, uh, their semen supplier delivered a, a bag of semen. It's got 100 tubes in it or whatever the case might be or 100 bags. And we stuff it in the cooler. And so we have a fan on here to circulate the air within the cooler. It can't circulate the air because we've just blocked everything off in there. And it's dirty and it's nasty too. So go to Walmart or you know, Target or wherever and get you the little plastic or metal containers where you can put like 20 bags of semen in there at a time. You can have an empty one there. You can facilitate rotating the semen by just putting one over top of it. Gently rotate it a couple times, set it in. You just rotated 20 doses of semen, and your door hasn't been open for a long time. So we, we've got to monitor this temperature. I like to, to see somebody have a clipboard there, and uh, at least daily, if not twice a day. Before you open the door on that, record what the temperature is, because sometimes people, if they're not recording it, that thing will start drifting either warm or cool, and we don't really realize it. And because nobody's really been paying attention to it. Um, hygiene. Clean the thing out once in a while. Dry it out good. You know, uh, a washcloth with hot water is, just does wonders in those things. Dry it out. And then the other thing, um, semen age. What we like to see is that semen be no more than three days old when we use it. So how are we going to start counting that? The semen was collected Sunday night, Monday morning. That's day zero. It got delivered to your farm on Monday at 10 o'clock at noon, whatever the case might be. That's day zero. Tuesday would be day one. Wednesday is day two. Thursday is day three. That's what we would prefer to see. Um, people say, well, but I'm using a, my board stud's using a 10-day extender. Um, talk with uh, Dr. Singleton and Dr. Stewart later about, about that. How is that, Kara? Yeah. <laughs> so the proper semen age, not more than three days. Now, can we get by with a little older? Yeah, we can. But we do know that that semen quality, as it goes, then it'll drop off pretty quickly. And, and we've got everything. All, all, of our, all of our marbles are right here, and, and we, we've got to make sure we're doing this correctly. So proper hygiene and organization when we're out in the breeding barn. Carrying a sort board with this much dust or this much manure packed on it, around to carry your spirets and your toilet paper and everything else that you're using, that's not cool. I mean, that, that, that's not hygienic at, at all. Go to Walmart, Target, whatever, buy you one of these little totes. They're yay long, that wide, that deep. I think they're made to put stuff in and slide under the bed. And uh, keep things clean. It's got a lid that goes on it. Keep things clean. you got ample supplies right there. Uh, you've got your, your spirets or your catheters. You've got your lube in here. You've got your toilet paper. You've got some extra sow cards, um, that sort of thing. And it's very user-friendly. They're long enough that, you know, you've got a 24-inch crate. They're whatever they are, three feet long. You slide it along, and, and it works good. They're inexpensive. They get dirty and nasty. Throw it away. Clean it up. Wrap it up. Give it to your wife for Christmas present, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and, but replace them. Keep it. Keep it hygienic. Track services by breeding technician, and I always say that with a bit of caution. I do think it's good that we keep people accountable, and there is a difference in farrowing rates by breeding technicians. We know that. One of the things I will caution you about is don't go using a ball bat on somebody that might have a little bit lower farrowing rate over a short period of time. Get out in the barn, see what's going on, you uh, that are decision makers. 
because a lot of times your best breeder, he's the guy going back breeding those problem sows. So maybe we're doing PCI and we had a little bit of an issue getting an inner cannula pass through the cervix. So if he's really an all-star, he's going to say to the rest of the breeding crew, you guys just keep on cranking. I'll go back and take care of this problem sow. May possibly have lower ferron rate on some of those problem sows. And so we've got to be careful how we analyze that. But I, I think it's really important that we do track them. Most all record-keeping systems have a column there on your breeding sheet where you can put the in initials of the technician down. Now, I'm going to get extreme on some of this. Call all your sows at seventh parity. Now, well, that may or not, may not be the right thing to do. But look at your records. Your sows, I don't care what genetics you are, there's a period of time in there, depending on how you develop them and that sort of thing, the performance statistically is going to drop off pretty significantly. We need to know that. We're playing a numbers game here. You cannot look at that sow today and be 100% certain that she's got two more litters left in her, she's got one more litter left in her, so you've got to play, you got to play the numbers thing. Be aggressive, though, I, I feel like, on calling these sows. Call all returns and PCNs. That's pretty extreme. There are some systems that do that. I, I'm not sure I'm advocating that. But I do think we need to be more judicial in the, the sows that we do breed back, whether she's a preg check negative, whether she's a recycle. There are certain ones of those that if she recycles, look, she needs to go to town. She's a fifth parity. She's over-conditioned. Um, her useful life is over. Let's not mess around with them. Let, let's get them out of the system. But I, I think we, at times, we need to be a little more aggressive. And so what happens a lot of times is we're, we're struggling a little bit with ferrolin rate and that sort of thing. So it's like breed everything, breed everything. Because, and, and granted, we don't want to have empty ferrolin crates. But we've got to really take a good, hard look at why are we having issues here with, with, with you know, ferrolin rates that aren't as good as what we would like. Um, whoops. And develop and implement. Develop and implement. We have a lot of farms that have a guilt program. We have a lot of farms that have it and don't really implement it. We have some farms that have no real guilt program at all. But we've got to develop and implement a strategic guilt program on these farms. And that's probably the weakest link I see industry-wide, whether I'm in North Carolina or Oklahoma or Minnesota. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's, that's an area that a lot of times really, you know, we, we stick those gilts in some old barn that we got because it's not really good enough for anything else. And it's too small to use as a finisher and it's too old and dilapidated. So what do we do? We're going to put our gilts in there. We've got we to gotta think that through. So I like using this picture. This is of a 2400 sow unit, outdoor unit in southern Illinois. And a lot of times you get some chuckles when you look at it. But I'm going to say that that's probably a better guilt development program than I see sometimes at farms. We talk about square footage. Hey, they got ample square footage. We talk about ad lib feed. Hey, they got plenty of feed. We talk about controlling the environment for them. Hey, it's a nice day. These gals are laying out here on a little dry patch. They're having a good time. If it gets a little chilly tonight, they can go in this old oil field tank that's full of straw, and they can, they can, they can regulate their own environment. We've got a vasectomized Michon boar here. We've got plenty of boar stimulus. Now, we also have some parasite issues being out on dirt and things like that, but uh, I'm not advocating that this is how you do your gilts, but I'm saying this is better than some that I see that are in total confinement. So we need to have a deliberate and defined acclimation program for gilts to prepare them for on-farm pathogens. You need to work closely with your veterinarian. And this can't be a random what we're going to do once in, a, once in a while. So let's use the example your, well, you've got a PERS negative farm or you've got a PERS positive farm. You're going to have different you're going to have different acclimation programs for those farms. So if you're a PERS positive farm, are you going to use a modified live virus on them? Are you going to, uh, are you going to use a live virus inoculation? Are you going to use an autogenous? Uh, are we going to do natural exposure with live animals? We're going to do feedback. What are we doing? There's no 
single program that works for everybody. You've got to work with your veterinarian and prepare these animals so that, that their immune system is matched up with what they're going to see when they go into the south farm. Probably the biggest, even if you have a good program, probably the biggest area we cheat on and, and we have to pay a price for is we didn't allow for sufficient cool down on these sows or on these gilts, I'm sorry. So I'm going to say a minimum of four weeks, and I would really rather have eight weeks before they come in. But so if we got a PERS positive but stable farm, and maybe we're using live virus inoculation on the gilts, those gilts can be pretty darn hot when we bring them into the sow unit. Well, we brought them in because... We know we're short of weanings next week, and we're, we've got to have these animals to breed, and so we brought them in. We can really cause a lot of chaos with bringing in animals that are shedding, you know, at a pretty high degree. Work with your veterinarian, develop a program, and stick to it. Now, it won't be the same program two years from now as it is today because your pathogens are going to change within your farms. you got to keep up, upgrading that. But I, I think guilt failure to perform a lot of times has absolutely nothing to do with that guilt herself, her genetics, anything else. It's how we treated her and what we did here. Heat no service. Greatest program you can ever do on your gilts, in my opinion. Um, determine heat on those gilts, re record it. I prefer that we put the gilts in stalls at that time and breed them three weeks later. But what that allows you to do is plan out three weeks ahead. So if I've got my targets to breed 15 gilts a week, and I've got 25 this week, I don't need to breed all 25 of those here in three weeks. So one of the easiest things I can do is I can select, okay, five of those lightest weight gilts, and I'll just simply roll them another three weeks. I'm going to put another 40 pounds of weight on them. I'm going to have them closer to that 3, 320 breeding weight. I can use some things like Altrinogest, Matrix, um, to, to roll them uh, into other groups. But you can plan and manage those matings rather than letting those gilts manage you. And I see that too many times that we're, we're letting the gilts because we're breeding them just as they come into heat. Gilts made in a third cycle minimum with a heat no service, you're pretty well, I'm going to be careful when I say this, but you're pretty well guaranteed you're mating them on third cycle. Um, we know that you heat no service or you put her in a crate and you made her at least on second. Odds are, in most programs, she had a cycle before that, before we really got intensely uh, uh, identifying those heats. It's great if you can really start heat checking them at an early age. Most farms don't always have the labor uh, to do that. Um, I like to see these gilts bred at about 320, feral at 420, and go in the feral house with a 3-0 body condition score. I see way, way too many gilts going into the Farron house with a 4-0 body condition score. I said, well, why do you got those gilts so heavy going in? Well, they lose a lot of weight when they're in Farron, so I'm going to compensate by getting them heavier. She's a 4-0 going in. She's a 3-0 coming out. She still lost a lot of weight, and she's still not, you know, we've got to look at how we're managing her in the Farron crates and, and what we're doing on feeding that, that sow in lactation because we really shouldn't be losing that kind of weight on these animals. Invest the time and the resources in your gilts. I think that will pay you great dividends. Track P1 and P2 retention rates. So what I mean by that, we feraled 100 gilts over this period of time. Of those 100 that we feral, how many of them are going to come back in and feral second litter? I see farms where we may only have 50% of those animals come back and feral second litter. That is not the gilts' fault. I don't care whose genetics you're using. I can take a Tamworth Hereford Cross and get better than a 50% retention rate. Right, Kara? And so we've really got to look at why are we losing these, these animals? Because our goal is to get as, as much of the population as possible in that three to five parity, that sweet spot. Those are your highly productive, low maintenance females. Those are normally kind of your problem free animals. We need to try to get as many of those as we can in there. So we, we've got to go back and take a look at what are we doing that our retention rates are not very high. I think you need to monitor your parity distribution. If you have a 50% replacement rate, you should be breeding 20% of your matings every week should be gilts. Simple math. Okay? I'm not saying your parity distribution should be perfect like that because it's never going to be. But if you had a, a time where 
man, we, we, we brought in a bunch of guilts over a six or eight month, 12 month period. That's great. But two years from now, you got a whole bunch right out here and you better be planning ahead for that because you're going to have a bunch of old sows. So you've got to monitor your parity distribution again. It's never going to be perfect. We know that.